It is being fractured into some very non-integrated pieces courtesy of American inaction. Think of your hometown. What if everything it needed for manufactured goods and food and energy it had to provide itself? Even if your hometown were Shanghai or Tokyo or London or Chicago, it would be impossible for you to live your current life. What the order has done is encapsulate the bulk of the world into a single town in which we all specialize in whatever we are good at, whether it be picking avocados or cutting metal or purifying butadiene or assembling flash drives or wiring wind turbines or instructing yoga. We then use the income from the sales of what we're good at to pay for the items and services we aren't good at. It isn't perfect, but it has promoted the greatest technological advancement in human history, brought most of us into the digital age, and created ever greater demand for ever greater levels of education. But none of this is a natural outcome of the normal world. Rather, it is instead an artificial outcome of the American-created security and trade order. Without global peace, the world gets smaller. Or, put more accurately, the one big world breaks up into several smaller worlds, and oftentimes mutually antagonistic worlds. To be blunt, our existing isms are woefully unable to manage coming challenges. Capitalism without growth generates massive inequality as those who already have political connections and wealth manipulate the system to control ever bigger pieces of an ever shrinking pie. The result tends in the direction of social explosions. Three of many examples of how it can go to pot are the anarchist movements within the United States during the Great Depression, the rise of Donald Trump in the Rust Belt as a reaction to the region's deindustrialization, and the general societal collapse of the Lebanese Civil War. The future of socialism is, if anything, darker. Socialism cannot generate capitalist levels of growth even when the pie is expanding, much less when it is shrinking. Socialism might be able to preserve economic equality, but that's unlikely to save the model. Unlike capitalism, where at least the elites might be able to struggle through, in socialism, everyone will become noticeably worse off every year. Mass uprising and state fracture are pretty much baked into that particular dessert product. Fascist corporatism might provide an option by outsourcing much of the clinical management of the economy to large corporations, but ultimately it will face the same problems as capitalism and socialism. Inequality from concentrating power within firms, degrading stagnation from a shrinking pie, and since the government is clearly in charge, it wouldn't take long for finger-pointing to transition into pitchfork marching. That just leaves command-driven communism. Sadly, it just might be the most viable of the four, but only if it crushes the population's souls to the degree that having an opinion is suppressed by an overarching 1984-style propagandesque dictatorship. And of course, it will retain all the normal shortcomings of the model as we know it. It really only works if those running the command economy guess correctly on which techs will win out, and which goods will be needed, and how to access the relevant inputs to make them, every single time. We aren't simply looking at a demographically induced economic breakdown. We are looking at the end of a half millennium of economic history. At present, I see only two pre-existing models that might work for the world we're devolving into. Both are very old school. The first is plain old imperialism. For this to work, the country in question must have a military, especially one with a powerful navy capable of large-scale amphibious assault. That military ventures forth to conquer territories and peoples, and then exploits said territories and peoples in whatever way it wishes, forcing conquered labor to craft products, stripping conquered territories of resources, treating conquered people as a captive market for its own products, etc. The British Empire at its height excelled at this, but to be honest, so did any other post-Columbus political entity that used the word empire in its name. If this sounds like mass slavery with some geographic and legal displacement between master and slave, 
you're thinking in the right general direction. The second is something called mercantilism, an economic system in which you heavily restrict the ability of anyone to export anything to your consumer base, but in which you also ram whatever of your production you can down the throats of everyone else. Such ramming is often done with a secondary goal of wrecking local production capacity so the target market is dependent upon you in the long term. The imperial era French engaged in mercantilism as a matter of course, but so too did any up-and-coming industrial power. The British famously product dumped on the Germans in the early 1800s, while the Germans did the same to anyone they could reach in the late 1800s. One could argue, fairly easily, that mercantilism was more or less the standard national economic operating policy for China in the 2000s and 2010s, under American strategic cover, no less. In essence, both possible models would be implemented with an eye towards sucking other people's dry and transferring the pain of general economic dislocation from the invaders to the invaded, getting a larger slice of a smaller pie, as it were. Both models might theoretically work in a poorer, more violent, more fractured world, particularly if they are married. But even together, some version of imperialist mercantilism faces a singular, overarching, likely condemning problem. Too many guns, not enough boots. In the old imperial and mercantile days, when the Brits, or Germans, or French, or Dutch, or Belgians, or Japanese, or Portuguese, or Spanish, or Argentines, etc., showed up, they'd bring guns and artillery to regions whose peak military technologies were decidedly spear- and knife-driven. The newcomers didn't typically have to make too many examples of the locals before the locals decided it would be best if they just did what they were told assuming they survived long enough to have a decision to make. Possessing such a sharp and obvious technological edge meant the occupiers could maintain control with tiny overseas forces. The best example is probably the British Raj in India. The British typically had far fewer than 50,000 soldiers in their South Asian colony, sometimes fewer than 10,000, to a local population of over 200 million at the typical high ratio of one occupier per 4,000 occupied. It would be as if the population of my hometown of Marshalltown, Iowa, tried to occupy the entirety of the United States west of the Mississippi. In an era when one side was industrialized and the other was not, such a numerical imbalance could work. But as the Indians became more technologically sophisticated, the idea that the Brits could maintain control went from eyebrow-raising to inordinately hysterical in short order. It was only a matter of time and political will before the Indians sent the Brits packing. Hashtag Gandhi is badass. Today, there are certainly parts of the world that are more industrialized and better armed than others. But there is no longer a 19th century style yawning chasm between an industrialized world and a pre-industrialized world. Consider how much fun the United States, a country near the head of the pack, had attempting to reshape Afghanistan, a country near the bottom. It doesn't take excellence in guns and railroads and asphalt and electricity and computers and phones to still have guns and railroads and asphalt and electricity and computers and phones. The only countries in a post-2022 world that might be able to maintain an overseas empire are those that can have three things going for them. A serious cultural superiority complex, a military capable of reliably projecting power onto locations that cannot effectively resist, and lots and lots and lots and lots of disposable young people. The last country that boasted that combination of factors was the United States in the World War II aftermath. America's rise in the 1800s and early 1900s was technological, geographic, demographic, and economic. But when the guns fell silent in 1945, the Yanks enjoyed technological, geographic, demographic, economic, and military, and strategic, and numerical advantages. But even then, the Americans chose not to occupy the territory they had conquered, even when their potential 